So Larry, how much fun did you have when writing Santa Bring My Girlfriend Back? And how did you come up with it? Santa Bring My Girlfriend Back was triggered by a bit of unpleasant family drama on Christmas Day two years ago, uh, 2018. I woke up the next morning. I was the first one up. I was putting around my kitchen, making the coffee, waiting for the house to come awake, and wondering how such a fabulous holiday had gone so awry. And the line just popped in, came out of nowhere, popped right into my head with the melody. I've been drinking way too much this Christmas. My friends all want to know the reason why. And it was there. And I was like, I like that. Why is this guy drinking so heavily? I mean, I had not actually been drinking all that heavily on Christmas Day, but I, I had every reason to. Um, and so I, I sat for just a minute or two. Why is this guy drinking? And I got the idea that, well, he's he's drinking because, you know, he, he, he was in love with some girl and Santa Claus stole her away. In my construct, Santa is single. There is no Mrs. Claus yet, or maybe she's passed or whatever. And Santa steals this guy's girlfriend. Once I had that idea, the rest of the lyrics came pretty easily. The melody followed pretty easily. And I had the song done I mean, on and off over the course of a couple of weeks. And it, it felt like it was something cool and special. And I was really psyched about it. Uh, I sat on it for about a year and a half before I presented it to uh, Greg Cohen, our producer. But then uh, when the band got their hands on it, they just turned it into something really magical. What inspired you to become a songwriter? Not, nothing inspired me to become a songwriter. I didn't think I was a songwriter. Um, it's funny. I, I saw a recent interview with Paul McCartney where he was asked, he's been asked this question probably thousands of times, and it shocks me that he's so polite in answering it every time. You know, did any of the Beatles re read or write music? And, and Paul said, no, none of us could read music because for us, and he's pointing, he's going, for us, Music isn't something that happens here on a page. Music is something that happens up here. And that's what I started to experience around halfway through high school S with no musical training whatsoever, didn't play an instrument, and I still don't play an instrument, although I can pick out melody on a keyboard. Songs started writing themselves in my head, or they'd start and then I'd finish them. I'd continue with the lyrics and figure out what the next lyrics and melody line would be. But I didn't, I, I was a uh, high school nerd, um, not popular. And the last thing I was going to do was proclaim to the unbelieving masses that I was a songwriter. So I kept it to myself until I was about 32 or 33. Didn't tell a soul. What was the craziest thing that has ever happened to you in your music career? I don't know about the craziest thing. Coolest thing was that I, I contributed a few songs to my first stab at seeing if my songs could be any good was that I contributed a handful of songs to a record that a band was doing back in the 90s. And this is how I met our current, one of our two guitarists, Mike DeCampo. Mike DeCampo was in this band. We've been friends ever since then. The lead singer of that band, one of DeCampo's uh, childhood buddies from Brooklyn, was a roadie for Cher at the time. And he was the lead singer of the band that DeCampo was in. And uh, the lead singer did half the songs. I contributed almost half the songs. And this lead singer, he kept saying his name was, it's funny, almost every guy in the band was Mike or Mick. It was, it was, it was Mike DeCampo, Mick, Mike. Uh, was, everyone had to have nicknames. So Mike DeCampo, we still call him Doc. So this other Mike, not Mike DeCampo, the Mike lead, lead singer was like, he was, he was, he'd say, he said, the great lady has promised me that if she can show up here, this was in Central Jersey, a studio in Central Jersey, if she can make it here, she will do a duet with me. And we were all like, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, but sure enough, Cher did a show at one of the um, Atlantic City casinos, and she finished the show around 1130 at night, put her entire cast and crew on a bus, and drove the 90 minutes up to, we were somewhere around Colt's Neck, and she came into the studio and she stayed all night long and did this duet with Mike, the lead singer. And that was maybe the, the coolest thing was to watch her work because she's one of the great pop vocalists of all time. And yet 
and she could have phoned this in. It was a duet, right? It's for this unsigned band, but she had her vocal coach with her. She had all of her backup singers with her, and she worked all night long to deliver the best possible vocal performance for her buddy. And I had, I, I had, I always just thought someone like her just comes in and she's perfect and she sings, you know, and as I've developed as a singer, I always think back to that, to watching her with her vocal coach, because I, I wasn't trained as a singer and I didn't even sing the first four songs on our debut album. So I, I'm, I'm still learning what my voice can do. And if you listen to my vocals on this new single, Since You've Been Gone, uh, they're, I think, qualitatively, well, they're certainly different, arguably better than any of my past vocals. I did the Santa Bring My Girlfriend Back song as a bass baritone. And on this song, my our producer, Greg Cohen, pushed me to sing higher than I'm comfortable doing. And I, I think I pulled it off. And that was cool and interesting to see. Who have been some of your favorite people and projects to work with? Uh, I, I work with the one band, right? I mean, my my other than that, other than the, that project where... Cher came in and sang the duet. I've only worked with these guys for the most part. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't really know how to answer that. I, I'm lucky to work with the musicians I work with. They're all brilliant at what they do, and every one of them always brings something completely unforeseen and cool to the track that you know, you're sitting there, you think it's one thing, and then after the guys have played on it, it's something else, and it's better than you could have ever imagined. It's, it's my favorite part of what we do is is watching the songs come together in the studio. Are you looking forward to performing live in concert again when it's safe to do so? When it's safe to do so, we we'd love to. It it's I mean we're we're not spring chickens. We're older guys with wives and kids almost universally. Um it makes scheduling difficult, but I, we could certainly manage to play out around Manhattan if and when the powers that be let us open up. Which album will you release next? And will you be doing another holiday track anytime soon? The, the, the holiday tracks were, they're both accidents. I, I don't know where they came from. Uh, so I, I, I think it would be weird if somehow I wrote a third Christmas song. I don't rule it out, but it's, it's certainly not my plan. You know, we're working, we're halfway through uh, the tracks for this second album, still not titled, as I told your dad. Um, with any luck, we get it out second quarter this year. Who knows? But, you know, so that album and then, uh, you know, we'll just move on to the next. I hope pretty soon after that. Have you ever produced any music videos? I don't produce them. I I, I approve videos that uh, we have a small team of people that back us up on the marketing and public relations and distribution fronts. And uh Jonathan Chang, who's our marketing guy, he seeks out uh, video producer director teams that an indie band like ours can afford. We pay for all this ourselves. We, although with this second album, we have some distribution help from Universal Music Group. We're technically unsigned. We're not under a record label deal to anybody. So we pay for everything. And you know, our videos are are very low budget, but I think all pretty creative uh, given the budget limitations, but I, I don't produce them and, and I, I can't claim to take credit for any of the ideas behind them. What's your favorite genre of music? 80s rock and pop, probably. Uh, for me, by the time we got into the 80s, all the, gr all the influences of so many genres of music were there, whether it was classic rock, soft rock you still had some 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 influences of, of disco and the other dance things uh blues and r b I, I was I, I was in college and law school as the uh punk and new wave movements uh came to the fore and you had all those different great genres carrying over into the 80s you know, all the old guard of rock were still alive and in their prime you know Guys like the Beatles and the Stones were all in their 40s and, and still putting out great records. And then you had all the, the new up-and-comers, right? In this country, for me, the, the single greatest rock band has always been the Ramones or 
after the Stones in the in the UK came the Clash, right? The Police. I mean, Blondie. Just uh, and in fact, we're trying on this second album to pay homage to to some of those '80s sounds that those of us in the band really loved. We're uh, I describe myself as a as a storyteller, songwriting and writer. And if you listen to almost any of our songs, I there's usually a narrative arc, a little stories being told. The Santa song tells a little story. Since You've Been Gone doesn't really tell a story. It's just a guy who's had his heart crushed. But most of the other songs tell a little story. So I'm trying to, we've been trying to figure out how to marry the storyteller traditions which for me are largely rooted in the soft and southern rock of the 70s with the what I thought were the, just the greatest musical influences that that we had going on in the 80s and and I think that's what you hear on this first single the single version of since you've been gone do you have a favorite band or artist that you like to listen to i listen to i listen to everything except jazz and the blues i've never I should remedy that. I should lock myself in, in, in a room somewhere and spend weekends listening to jazz and the blues, but I've never listened to them. Uh, I get up on most Saturday and Sunday mornings and, and turn on my Sinatra station on, on Pandora or one of the other streaming services. So I, I, I listen to the big bands, the, the classic vocalists like Frank and Dean and Ella Fitzgerald. Um, and some of the newer ones that I've discovered, um, big fan of, uh, a woman, uh, I think she's Canadian, Emily Claire Barlow, who I discovered on my Sinatra station. Um, but, um, I like, I don't have any one favorite band. I like, I like the guys and gals who have a unique sound and push boundaries. For instance, go listen to Marshall Tucker. Um, heard it in a love song or can't you see and and listen to all the instruments on on those tracks and how beautifully all those guys play then go listen to one of my favorite 80s bands the out of the UK Paul Weller who originally founded the jam he went from being one of the you know punk rock or new wave guys in the jam to a very different kind of band in the style council and the style council also they've just got a ton of different instruments going on horns and keys and 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 there to me it's 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 the guys who push the boundaries a little or or mix the genres the way Bowie did sometimes and you can listen to go listen to Bowie on like changes and it was not a whole lot like what other people were doing at the time and it's not it's not necessarily rooted in its time. I think it's as fresh today as it was when he put it out. How has the pandemic affected the band this past year? I was a little hesitant to call the guys together to start working on this album because we were all spooked and, and scared and didn't know what was going on. So I, I started slowly in June, just me with our producer, Greg Cohen, at his home studio on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. But we made really good progress on a lot of new songs. And I was like, we can't, we just can't wait any longer, right? And it's like we can't put our lives totally on hold because of whatever the hell this pandemic is. So let's be safe. You know, the, the studio that we record in is pretty big, Kaleidoscope Sound in Union City, plenty of isolation booths. So let's let's just get everybody in there and get back to work. And, you know, that that's... Uh, that's what we've been doing. The, about the only nod that I will probably make to the pandemic coming up is I, I think I'm going to order a, a pile of High Plains Drifters branded face masks for, for the band and, and maybe some fans if, if we throw up a merch store somewhere. 